Welcome to the Sound of Economics, the podcast series by Bruegel, the Brussels-based economic think tank. I'm Giuseppe Porcaro. I'm Alicia Garcia Herrero. And today we will land in Sri Lanka to both understand better the current crisis of the island as well its relation with China. This episode is part of Bruegel's focus on global China as seen from Europe, which includes our monthly newsletter Songwa Mundus, to which we invite you to subscribe. The link is in the show notes. Joining our conversation today is Azanga Abeyagonasekera. Is that correct, <laughs> Asanga? Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for having me. Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Who is an international security and geopolitics analyst and strategic advisor from Sri Lanka itself. He has led two government think tanks providing strategic advocacy with and with almost two decades of experience in the government sector in advisory position um, is definitely an authority to let us understand better what is going on in the island. Um, so thanks a lot for connecting with the Sound of Economics today. And if I'm correct, you're joining us from Washington, D.C. Yes, that's correct. Uh, so... Let's go to the topic. Uh, Sri Lanka is living one of its gravest crises at the moment. In May, the Prime Minister Mahinda Raya Rajapak Paksa has resigned after long protests over con- of the country deepening economic crisis. For months, the country has been trapped in a brutal economic crisis. Uh, Sri Lanka is currently unable to pay for imports of essentials such as food, medicines and fuel, uh, tax cuts and abrupt ban on fertilizers, imports, decimated crop yields and the collapse of tourism during the pandemic all helped to push the country into the worst economic crisis it has faced since gaining independence in 1948. The nation, uh, the nation island owes nearly 7 billion US dollars this year Uh, and has next to no foreign reserves left. After the preemptive announcement to suspend all foreign debt repayments until discussions for an IMF bailout are completed on May uh, 18, Sri Lanka stepped into the dangerous part of a sovereign default. Asanga, can you explain to our listeners how did we get to this? Yes, there are multiple factors um, uh, out of this. I think the in 2019, when Gotabe Rajapaksa, the present president, came to power, it was a heavily uh, autocratic uh, regime which came to power with an inward ultranationalist posture, uh, basically not uh, taking in the sound advice that was given by IMF uh, as well as international partners. A uh, regime was, uh, it was the first time in the Sri Lankan history we, have a, we had a sibling regime where the prime minister was brother of the president and five others were also there, the family members. So it was a, uh, it was a family rule, uh, dynastic sort of uh, rule, a government. And, and structural changes that was made initially Uh, to the constitution, bringing power, more power to the president from the legislature, uh, as well as the 26 uh, military appointments with a heavily militarized uh, regime. Uh, those are the factors to look at uh, basically an inward um, policy prescription uh, that the government, for example, the fertilizer crisis, which was which actively went into as um, you know, a huge agricultural Uh, issue in Sri Lanka. So these multiple factors, uh, as well as the uh, the borrowings, uh, you know, kept on borrowing in uh, interest rates, um, which is uh, 6% and uh, more. So country could not sustain. And with the pandemic, as well as the tourism drop, the tax cut reform. Uh, so the the fiscal policies that was adopted were not prudent, they were not practical, they were no objective. And these are the main factors, uh, basically, that we got into this crisis. And today, unfortunately, uh, four out of five are hungry, 
22% of the population are hungry because they're only having one meal a day, according to the United Nations. We are now at a humanitarian crisis in Sri Lanka. This is obviously incredibly worrying from what you are uh, describing. And um, I don't know if Alicia wants to jump in already, but I have a first question because, of course, you you mentioned and we mentioned some of the causes of the crisis. But here at the Sound of Economics, we would like to, to understand a bit more about the role of foreign investments in this world story, how they evolved uh, in the past uh, in the past few years i mean like having a, a bit of a, a backward uh, view on um, on what has been going on and what's going on at the moment the very moment on on this side well i i would like to add if if i may just step to the, to your question i think it's important to note that Sri Lanka has been one of the landmarks of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, receiving a huge amounts of um, funding for project finance, including ports and, and other infrastructure projects. And I'd like to know from Asanga whether these projects were useful. And this is not only about China. I mean, it is, of course, the uh, Sri Lankan government that needs to decide, you know, whether a project is useful or not. But the point is, how was the that funding invested, and how does it come into the equation of the situation today? I think uh, China is uh, a considerable factor. Um, uh, it is not the only factor, but it's a considerable factor of the crisis. The Chinese debt for- portfolio is about 10%, uh, equal to Japan's. Um, but uh, we have borrowed at very high interest rates, 5.6%. Uh, Hambantota, for example, we borrowed for Hambantota uh, port project five consecutive times. Uh, it's about 1.2 billion uh, loan. But one particular uh, transaction was on about 6.5% interest rates. So the these inter- the high heavy um, uh, high interest rates as well as the heavy borrowings bit to per projects which uh, does not uh, we could not sort of the business models uh, uh, we could not gain any profit from it uh, such as Matala Airport is a clear example 203 million uh, borrowings uh, built near a natural century uh, wildlife century. Uh, it's not feasible. Uh, when uh, I did a, basically a research on this particular airport, uh, where the Auditor General has clearly mentioned it's not feasible. The, the EIA, the environmental impact assessments, how this was done is a question. So I think most of the BRI projects, Sri Lanka was one of the initial partners of the BRI from 2013. Uh, all of them, I mean, it, it moved from port projects to um, investment zones to, uh, you know, airports to water project to multiple projects, uh, power plants. But unfortunately, uh, most of the BRI projects uh, could not generate the revenue that is expected. Hambantota port, for example, we were expecting thousands of ships, but only about 100 is there. Uh, I mean, so the expected revenue is not there. Then we have built, uh, you know, beautification projects such as, uh, you know, the tallest tower in Colombo. Uh, it has not generated any revenue. Uh, there's a revolving restaurant on the tower, but then these things have not, uh, you know, uh, any sort of uh, investment. So uh, the Colombo port city, which was, you know, a reclaimed land in the seafront by the Chinese uh, is another good example. For two years, there's not been a single investor. Uh, When I interviewed the Chinese managing director of the Port City project, he clearly mentioned there will be European uh, investors, there will be US investors coming in. I think the, the, the pandemic environment the Easter Sunday bombing in Sri Lanka. So all that uh, reduces significant, you know, the tourism portfolio also uh, in Sri Lanka. So the BRI, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, has not 
uh, done really well in Sri Lanka uh, due to these factors. And uh, there, I mean, I, I see another side to the BRI uh, projects in Sri Lanka, which I call it a, a strategic trap. Um, which is in three dimensions, I assess it. The first is um, the Chinese funding that has come to the political party level. I'm talking about IDCPC, which is the International Development for Chinese uh, you know, Communist Party, as well as the Rajapaksa political party, the SLPP. Then the human rights uh, dimension where Sri Lanka has been supported by China and China and Sri Lanka for the first time in its foreign policy reciprocally supports uh, Xinjiang, uh, talking about Xinjiang. Uh, the third dimension is the surveillance and the military dimension. So these are uh, three areas that are visible in Sri Lanka. When you speak about these three areas, do you connect them as well with the current crisis, with the current political crisis? Well, uh, China uh, did support the model, uh, the, the heavily militarized model, which was introduced uh, uh, by the president in 2019, the 26 appointments. I mean, there was, I mean, out of the countries that supported the, the human rights uh, concerns, uh, you know, when Europe, uh, EU, as well as the uh, European Union start speaking about these concerns on the, you know, the, the reducing of the democratic uh, essence in the country as well as the human rights, but China was the only uh, country that supported um, Sri Lanka in this uh, area. So, the I mean, it is a factor. Uh, the three dimensions I mentioned uh, is a factor to the crisis because the inward policy, such as the fertilizer ban, uh, was uh, the, the Rajapaksas were trying to introduce uh, import subsidization. Uh, a more export-driven uh, economy, an economy that uh, is more sort of, you know, you grow your own vegetables. I mean, two days ago, um, there was an announcement saying Sri Lanka has now declared four days uh, working for government servants, so not five days. So one day you take a break and uh, so you, you're given a, a day to grow vegetables. So... These inward looking factors, I mean, starting from initially, uh, were the issues that uh, they kept the sound advice away. IMF warned Sri Lanka multiple times, uh, even the economic advisors. So that was the main issue. Uh, Giuseppe, if I may, I mean, this is so interesting because, in a way, I was totally unaware of uh, what one could even call, uh, you know, Sri Lanka's own world circulation policy, if I may put it that way, because, you know, as, as you said, it's it's the idea of being less reliant and being able to, to have your own, uh, in this case, of course, uh, as simple as your own food, uh, growing your food so that you become less dependent on imports, which in a way the current circumstances may make sense because unfortunately Sri Lanka doesn't have enough reserves to pay for imports. But the whole idea is that it started before the crisis. And maybe, you know, as, as you're pointing out, it, it's part of the warnings from the IMF. But I, I want to go back to the IMF, if it Giuseppe allows me, because I, you know, the, we were close. I may be wrong, but that's what my understanding to a deal, to, to an IMF bailout. And something happened, and I wonder what happened. Is it related to debt restructuring disagreements? So I, I really like to hear from you on that one. Uh, maybe on this, if I may add, because, uh, of course, when we speak about IMF and bailouts, uh, the first things that comes to, to our minds are the structural reforms uh, uh, packages which were uh, quite infamous uh, back in the 80s and the 90s in the several parts of the world. Uh, therefore, I mean, of course, the situation is completely changed, but uh, uh, what, kind of, uh, uh, what kind of choices they are? Uh, you know, one is what kind of prospects, but what, what kind of choices they are on the table for Sri Lanka to go out of this crisis in, um, in a way that can be sustainable uh, on not just from the balance sheet side, uh, but also uh, politically uh, viable and also uh, something that is going to be 
feasible in order not to wait too much on on the population itself uh, well um some of the uh, you know uh, solutions uh, that uh, one of the f- first solution was to talk into china so when wang yi came to sri lanka the president uh, requested for debt restructuring the chinese debt but uh, that was rejected that was not accepted by china uh the restru- without restructuring so they mentioned that they could give another loan uh, to settle their own loans but what interest is a question still to the researchers we don't know the interest the 1.5 billion uh, request was 1.5 billion uh, credit line as well as a 1.5 billion syndicate loan um so the the in, the i think it's important at this uh, juncture to understand what are the interest rates of if we are further borrowing from china to settle the loans the getting on to the imf to the same page of the imf uh, is another concern uh, for china because china the chinese ambassador clearly mentioned that they don't want uh, sri lanka to default and uh, that china would be uh, there but since sri lanka defaulted uh, it says that to treat all loans equally uh, this is what ambassador mentioned that to to the central bank uh, chinese as well as the other loans so here is a uh, i think a, a, a problem that the central bank of uh, sri lanka is having because to treat all the loans equally uh, because the chinese loans are, are quite different to the other loans so the imf on the restructuring how much uh, china would accept and uh, what would be the conditionalities or is the concern right now prime minister has mentioned uh, recently that he needs 5 billion immediately to for the imports of the essential goods such as medicine uh, we are out of medicine the essential medicine the food is a huge crisis that's why i mentioned it is turned to a humanitarian crisis so immediately sri lanka requires this assistance india has come forward uh, and uh, amazingly given so much of assistance uh, in terms of oil shipments the fuel the essential basics so uh, that's that's going on right now so the other countries also has uh, even united states have mentioned that they would assist and many others so the 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 fuel crisis is a serious issue the food and the medicine so uh, immediately what it required is uh, some funds to uh, foreign reserves to you know to uh, for the imports i mean to bring in the uh, the fuel as well as the essentials so uh, what alicia mentioned that you need to be on the same page uh, with the imf that's important on the restructuring and how much china would assist and this uh, time is really really important the meeting between the us ambassador and the chinese ambassador uh, which happened recently is a good indication that both nations should come together to support uh, a country like sri lanka and uh, many other nations such as india and because i mean people are hungry the protest turned violent uh, with burning of 40 houses of the member of parliament now there is a indication that's coming from colombo which i have been sort of analyzing that the next round of protests will be targeting the rich and the more affluent in the society so sri lanka had two youth insurrections in 1988 and 1971 so it's not a country that didn't have sort of you know full blown insurrections Uh, it is a nation with a such a volatile i would say uh, a, a polity that it can turn into targeting uh, with the sufferings of the people and the deaths uh, with if the humanitarian crisis go out of control it can move in to that direction unfortunately um alisa do you want to add something on this before we move on because i have a, a more broader question uh, zooming out from sri lanka to the region and we are uh, using our time very efficiently because we're getting really to the core of what our podcast is really about is uh, china in the world and 
to just uh, get a positive spin at the end of the day, because this has already happened. And of course, we need to solve this situation. Um, I'm thinking, what kind of role could the G20, and especially given that it, you know, within the Indonesian presidency, I mean, any role we, we uh, Asanga, we were, we got stuck with the DSSI. I mean, this debt restructuring agreement and not restructuring, actually, simply a delay in payments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which was no longer um, agreeable uh, during the Italian presidency. So we basically stopped it uh, in December 2021 at the worst of all times, because that's when the Fed started to roar. Yeah. And I mean, I'm hiking rates and you guys are going to pay much more for your debt. And I think given that we have that presidency, could, and this is the question, Sri Lanka be an example of, you know, what may happen to a lot of frontier markets uh, which are now confronted with humongously more expensive debt service because of Fed interest rates, but also, to be very frank, based on your conversation, because of China not agreeing, agreeing fully yeah, on, on the terms of a potential uh, IMF deal. So I hope the question was clear. Sorry for the noise. Um, no, definitely. I mean, this can... Uh on debt sustainability will be one of the key issues right now with the geopolitics in Europe as well as in in Ukraine. Many, uh, you know, commodity prices going up, the fuel prices. So there will be ripple effects uh, of this uh, to many nations. I mean, what happened to Sri Lanka, many nations uh, could face. So right now, Sri Lanka, I mean, we are requesting assistance from everyone international donors, the G20, everybody. Um, so to, you know, help us at this uh, particular moment. And uh, Sri Lanka need to reach out to all of them. I mean, who have been, we, I mean, President admitting that he he was a good sign. He said, he mentioned that he, 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 uh, he carried out, several policy blunders that, you know, during his, uh, you know, tenure, and he admitted on the fertilizer issues, on various inward policies. So those are good signs, and the new prime minister welcoming, uh, you know, assistance, aid from many nations, reaching out. Um, but the, the, here's the situation. I mean, I see a few factors also that is not so attractive. Uh, I mean, uh, weeks ago, there was an appointment uh, uh, with political favoritism. Again, uh, a casino owner, a boss was appointed to the member of parliament. Uh, protesters were very angry. Over this. It's a very fragile situation. So you to satisfy the protest is still going on. So protest, you got, they're saying we need a new culture. They're blaming the political culture for this. So, which I agree, of course, with the protesters, there is a component there on, you know, working on, you know, uh, basically intervening on the judiciary, intervene, I mean, uh, making constitutional amendments whenever they want. So, uh, and also on a high level of corruption. So, they, the voices of the protesters are true. I mean, they, those those concerns need to be addressed. So, um, I mean, if I mean, I think the priority needs to be set uh, more than micro level adjustments, such as, you know, giving one day off, uh, you know, to grow vegetables or, or, you know, to minimize the cost of of the government's servants. I think more macro level uh, is what is required on on tax tax adjustments as well as on the debt restructuring. Uh, So that is what is immediately uh, required. And um, India, for sure, uh, a country, the neighboring country, can assist uh, so much in this regard. I mean, in the past, also India has assisted. So um, there are several uh, areas that uh, we could focus on. I mean, it's a country that depends heavily on tourism, unfortunately. So the tourism industry uh, has completely dried up. And um, so what we need is like some sort of relief uh, from some of those sectors to stabilize the country uh, immediately. And um, so China, US and many other countries, uh, European EU, especially on the Sri Lankan exports. Um, uh, so it can help. Uh, I mean, EU has helped Sri Lanka, uh, you know, so much uh, in, in terms of crisis. 
And um, this is a time that uh, Sri Lanka requires assistance. But Sri Lanka also needs to take more uh, objective measures as well as, you know, moving towards a more democratic uh, showing the human rights areas and improvements in many other areas. So it requires all that. The political instability is still there because we have a prime minister uh, uh, appointed. He has only one seat. Uh, I mean, one seat in the parliament. The first time in the Sri Lankan history, again, we have a prime minister with one seat, supported by the Rajapaksa regime, the parliamentarians. So here is a liberal prime minister needs to work with the the uh, the inward policy. So it's sort of a duality, I see. Uh, so he's trying. He's while he's projecting more liberal values, you have the the people who support him. Uh, talking about you know the that's the still the ultra nationalists. So this is where the problem is. It's a it's a it's an interim government. I see. It's not a uh, because you you cannot have a prime minister with one seat and supported by the other side. So interim government until elections. So the twenty first amendment is another thing which is a structural adjustment uh, promised by the prime minister to reverse the power which uh, the president got. Uh, from the the twentieth amendment, which is from the legislature to the president, so he's going to reverse it back. And here's the thing: the civil society is not so happy of uh, of the document. So I heard from what I heard, hear from Dr. Jahan uh, Pereira, who's a civil society activist and academic. He mentioned that you know it cannot. I mean, what his promise is uh, is not seen in the document. So these are a lot of things. I mean, I think more than structural adjustments in the political area, what is required is immediate relief on the economic side. And the uh, because if you don't settle the economics, you will get into a security situation. Uh, this is my worry. Um, we are going to go towards the end of this episode quite soon. But uh, Asanga, I, from what you're saying, you're quite clear about the humanitarian crisis that there is at the moment and the immediate action that needs to be taken on this side. Then, of course, there is the economic uh, part that, that needs to be solved uh, a bit as a prerequisite in order to 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 move forward. Uh, but what is... What you are ringing the alarm bell is that the political situation stays... E- hyper mega fragile at the moment um, and for something that started with a political crisis in the first place this might be a little bit of a catch like uh, how can you solve um, the economic issues if on the political side there is such a huge vol- volatility and fragility um, you mentioned about tourism uh, which uh, you know um, could have been an engine of, uh, of, of uh, recovery at that stage when, you know, uh, at least here in U- Europe and other regions are starting to again travel intercontinentally and, and going towards uh, 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 holiday periods and stuff like this. But obviously in such a political environment, that's not going to be um, a viable option uh, for, for that industry to, to recover at that stage. So it's a little bit of a, I mean, from what I understand, there is a, a quite uh, in, in intricate situation. And it doesn't, I mean, at least I didn't get from your analysis uh, some sort of uh, immediate way out of the political impasse. This might take a little bit of time, uh, right? They, they will, will elections per se going to be sorting out such, 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 uh, such intricacy? Uh, or do we need to look more in the, on, on the medium to longer term for, for this political crisis to be solved? And um, how, you know, what, what are the more medium term kind of prospects also? Because uh, it would be good to, to look a little bit more ahead, uh, I mean, two steps ahead, if it's possible, eh? if, if it's possible for, y- for you to project us on, on this longer period, longer time span period, before we, we wrap up the conversation. 
No, I think, uh, yes, I mean, your observation is also correct. Uh, the immediate elections is what is the, what the protesters are asking, because one of the main themes of the protesters is called Go Home Gota. Gota means the president, Gota Bear. Uh, now, the family has gone out uh, of all the positions, but except for the president. So the, the protesters are saying, OK, our theme was the president to go. Um, now, the Prime Minister uh, was, I mean, he's been Prime Minister for five times. This is the sixth time that he's Prime Minister, well-experienced Prime Minister. So he puts a moral sort of a, a dimension to it, saying that if you uh, don't support, uh, you know, uh, right now you'll be in a serious crisis. So it's more of a moral dilemma, like, you know, you need to support uh, this situation right now or you would get into a humanitarian or you know a serious crisis which is true you need the political stability right now so requested uh, from all parties to join but the ex opposition leader uh, has taken a, a very strong position saying that he will not join the Rajapaksas so uh, because Rajapaksas are authoritarian and he will He's a democratic leader and he will not join an authoritarian leader. So here is a dilemma that you have. And then uh, the elections, is they are asking for it, but then you need the, you have the economic crisis to stabilize. Uh, my uh, assessment is that all parties need to come together and support this interim regime. This is an interim regime because a prime minister with one seat, you, you cannot, and he's not elected by the people. Uh, it was a it was a swap done at the parliament. So an interim regime with all parties supporting for politic, uh, economic stability, at least for a few months, uh, because the elections are due uh, in about a year for the parliamentary elections. But parliamentary elections, you can keep immediately if, if uh, the majority is reached from the opposition, then they can dissolve the par parliament uh, and go for elections anytime. But uh, but the Rajapaksas, uh, you know, the member of parli uh, parliaments are supporting the prime minister. Uh, so I think the it is required, but uh, all parties to stabilize the economy is what is required. Required because many people are hungry. They will, I mean, the people will die if it goes on like this. UN has given a clear warning, which I believe is absolutely uh, correct, and um, so. I think all parties, all members of the civil society needs to come to and support uh, in this situation. So the ambassadors can easily work uh, to, you know, at least to sustain, uh, stabilize the situation is what is very important because what you hear in the news are very disturbing right now. Children uh, would die from without medicine uh, in the village level, at the village level. So. These things are trigger factors uh, for, uh, you know, another sort of a full-blown up, uh, you know, sort of like the, the protests turning to violence. So um, I think it needs, it needs a sort of a delicate balance here, uh, satisfying the protesters as well as you. I mean, there have been crackdowns in, uh, of the protest also. Uh, so this has been, uh, I mean, seeing as, uh, you know, it's not a democratic process to, to do that. And uh, so th th I think all these factors need to sort of uh, come into play and uh, an immediate balance is sort of required and all parties need to come together. And I would like to thank you. And of course, we could speak uh, for much longer uh, about that but uh, unfortunately that's all the time we have for, for today's episode but we are going to keep closely, closely monitoring the situation in Sri Lanka and as you've seen uh, more for the broader context of uh, our uh, Zongo Mundus series this is an extremely interesting case studies uh, within the frame of uh, the global out outreach of China and um, uh, a companion to uh, another podcast uh, episode that we recently um, recorded, which was about the Belt and Road Initiative. So if you want to have some more background information about the Belt and Road Initiative, I suggest you to listen to the other episode as well, which is uh, uh, linked in the show notes. Uh, I would like to 
to thank you, Asanga, for for your time uh, and um, analysis. And um, this brings us to the end of this episode. And uh, I would also like to remind everyone that you can read in open access all the analysis by our scholars on our website, www.google.org. Uh, Asanga, Alicia, once again, thanks a lot for joining and thanks to our listeners for following us. Thank you. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Until next time, bye-bye.